Hi, I'm Lisa Butler. I'm a prostate cancer biologist from the University of Adelaide, and it's my pleasure today to be speaking with uh, Professor Chris Sweeney, uh, medical oncologist extraordinaire and uh, fellow Adelaidean. So welcome, Chris. I'm sorry the uh, ASM is not uh, benefiting from your presence this year. But virtually, virtually. I'm there. <laughs> I'm sure you probably wish you were in Adelaide at the moment. <laughs> who, would, who would not want to be in a COVID-free state, for sure? Exactly. Um, so, but it's great to still have you involved in the meeting. We really appreciate it. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the subject of your talk, and it's a subject that's also very near to my heart and my translational research, which is, is biomarker discovery and particularly clinical translation of that. Can you talk us just a little bit about, you know, how you see biomarkers fitting into clinical trials? It's obviously not as much as we would like, uh, but but where do you see the state of play at the moment? So it is a critical question, and the key thing is we need to like pass the conversation out into the current and the future, um, and then future is near future and distant future. So it's a very um, involved uh, answer. So I'll start with what's current and where are we at right now? And I'll focus on castration resistant prostate cancer. For the longest time, for all our prostate cancer treatments, it's oftentimes a question, do I use a hormone or do I use a chemotherapy? We really don't have biomarkers to distinguish which patients to use which modality, but we've used clinical characteristics of aggressive type cancer. So a patient who has a low PSA, um, large bony metastases and liver metastases, but maybe think chemotherapy rather than hormones. That's where we were really in up until about 2015. Where we are since then, and more recently with drugs approved in the United States, is we now have reason to biopsy patients, um, be it their metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, which if we can, a bone biopsy or lift and load metastasis, but not always possible. But circulating tumor DNA can also give us information. And as we know, we only do a test if it's going to change management or guide us to a therapy. And in 2020, we now have data that if we biopsy a patient and we identify that they have a real mutation in a real DNA damage repair gene, so the most classic obvious ones are BRCA1 and BRCA2, we now know that there is a definite role for use of a PARP inhibitor, um, Olaparib and Rucaparib in prostate cancer. So that's really the first biomarker drug pairing that we have. Now, the other one that's coming along for uh, prostate cancer, is, well, is there already, maybe even before the DDR, was if a patient has MSI high, and possibly even CDK12 mutations, are they patients more likely to respond to um, an immune checkpoint inhibitor with a PD-1 or PDL one inhibitor? There's definitely evidence to that, and maybe even with tumor mutational burden high. So I do get a biopsy, and if I can't get a tissue, then look at circulating tumor DNA. If I can't get that, resort to their primary pre-ADT tissue from their archived tissue and try and see if they have MSI high or a DNA damage repair that may find a drug. But when I say this to patients, I say, look, here's the deal, we're going to do this. And in all honesty, I think there's about a 20% chance at most that we'll have a DNA damage repair gene or MSI high status when you look at everything. And if we get a drug, it looks like in those very small patient population that have the right biomarker, there's about a 50% response rate. So it, is an opportunity where maybe 10% of patients out of the total hundred that we're trying to get tissue from to get to a treatment benefit from it. So that's where we are now. Now, moving a little further into the drug development realm, the next biomarker that's been looked at is uh, with therapeutic implications right now for metastatic disease, castration resistant state is AKT active, uh, inhibition with P10 loss. So most recently at the ESMO meeting, there was a study of abiraterone with or without ipatacertib presented. And for patients who had P10 loss, there was a significant improvement in radiographic progression. The treatment effect was relatively modest in the 0.75 range, 
but it needs longer follow-up and need to look at the other endpoints of time to pain, progression and overall survival, which need even longer follow-up. But it was a proof of concept showing that using the iPad asserted with the apparatus, you did delay the progression in patients that were more prone to have AKT activation, namely P10 loss. In this case, that it was measured by immunohistochemistry on the protein tissue, on the, um, by protein analysis of their mostly archived tissue. So there were probably some patients misclassified as being P10 loss, but may have, uh, sorry, P10 intact, but may have had P10 loss. Um, and the immunohistochemistry may not be the best way to measure this. Of the two thirds of the patients where they were able to have next genome sequencing done, um, we were able to look at P10 loss versus P10 intact by uh, ne uh, sorry, new generation uh, exome analysis. And what was found is that the treatment effect was found to be greater. However, not all patients had tissue that could pass the exome analysis, but the treatment effect for the uh, PAT asserted when added to apparatum was closer to 0.65. So it definitely identified patients that seemed to benefit from the IPAT asserted but we need to work on the biomarker. Um, now, that's the near future, um, maybe stepping out of the TARDIS pretty soon and having that in, available to us, but we need to work on the biomarker improvement, longer term follow-up, but it's a really good first shot across the bow with um, targeting the PI3 kinase P10 AKT access. So that's biomarker number two, castration-resistant prostate cancer or setting. Um, now, the next setting is what about helping distinguish um, who should get a hormonal therapy versus a chemotherapy? Um, and we do have data that's emerging from the specimens that we've got from Chartered and Stat Titan study, whereby uh, a number of people may be familiar with the Decipher company, that has the uh, gene classifier, the decipher high and low risk for identifying patients who are at risk for metastatic disease from localized disease. Using that same platform of measuring 22,000 genes, but that allows us to look at different gene sets. Um, one of our very own ANDS UP uh, investigators, Anas Hamid presented at ASC, GUASCO, what seems like three years ago, but it was one COVID year ago in February almost of 2019 at GUASCO, where it was seen that um, if patients had the PAM50 luminal B uh, gene profile, they tended to have the benefit of docetaxel early, whereas those with the basal PAM50 gene expression profile, which and PAM50 is derived by the same set of genes used for breast cancer, PAM50, luminal A, B, and basal, um, they didn't have a benefit. And the flip side to that, which was very interesting, is that um, Felix Feng presented on behalf of the Titan team that patients who got apalutamide for hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, they, and had the basal gene expression profile, did have a benefit, whereas the luminal, bees t luminal patients tended not to have a radiographic progression-free survival. So science future, going to the TARDIS and going well into the future, um, we need to actually follow up on that very strong lead. And we, that is going to happen by uh, coalescing all the biomarker data from Stampede Abiraterone, Stampede Docetaxel, Enzymet, where we have patients who did and didn't get Docetaxel and patients who did and didn't get in hormonal therapy. And then also <clears throat> try and see if we can um, confirm that uh, hypothesis generating data training set from the Stampede and Titan with proper prospective powered biomarker work. Chris, mm. do you, where do you feel the, um, the role of imaging might play in all of this? Yes. Yes. So we've got the word imaging just dropped in there. It's a little bit of a um, double-edged sword. So my, I'm going to be very clear. PSMA PET will change the way we, care, we treat patients. PSMA PET identifies and is metastatic disease much more reliably than uh, conventional CAT scan and bone scan, unequivocal. What we don't know is how does that impact our treatment paradigm? Um, for example, we see the treatment effect in charted 
with uh, patients who had minimal bony metastases um, was very low to zero, especially in the patients who had no uh, had relapses after metastatic disease. Sorry, after local therapy, prostate radiation, they had a um, no benefit from docetaxel. So now, if those patients had six or seven bony metastases, will they be patients who benefit from docetaxel because you're now seeing more in a PSMA pet, or are they still going to have an indolence of outcome? We also know a lot of patients with a rising PSA after prostatectomy didn't, with, when hormonal therapy and docetaxel were combined, didn't have a benefit uh, mm. with the docetaxel. So we will see more, um, but it may, and it may need to lead to a management change, which is often the end point, but management change does not automatically equal better patient outcomes. No, that's so very the true. Arts, sorry, Lisa? Yeah, so I was just saying, very true. So what we need to do is the proper studies and look at the, do, embed the imaging to see if it can identify patients who need intensified or less intense therapy. My other um, uh, item that I often address is, let's talk about the patient who presents with high-risk localized disease, Gleason 8, 9 disease, PSA 15, T3 on a uh, digital rectal exam. And that's the universal signal for a digital rectal exam, if you didn't know um, and the patient has two bony metastases, light uptake on the bone in, um, may, or maybe some pel retroperitoneal disease in the periodics. Is that metastatic disease that says we should just treat them with in systemic therapy alone? And I do know patients who have had their therapy de-intensified to systemic therapy alone, but these are the patients who would have been on the ends of RAD, the BOLAPAPE studies, where hormones and radiation therapy was better than radiation alone. And also the, we also know that radiation hormones was better than hormones alone, systemic therapy alone. So we really need to be careful and not um, jump the gun, as they say, and do, embed the studies, the new generation imaging, to see if it can help us work out who to intensify and de-intensify therapy. Um, but it's... We're, at no stage can I say that anyone can tell me how a PSMA pet will improve patient care in 2020. We are trying with Louise Amlett and um, others, mm -hmm. Anthony Joshua, uh, to get the scans from the Australian patients that did get PSMA pet as yep. part of Enzimet, Enzarad, and futurely, and in the future Dazzle to actually try and retrospectively look to see how do patients come, how do patients fare when they had um, a certain amount of cancer seen on PSMA PET versus conventional imaging. Mm, so I, I believe great. it'll improve treatment, but I don't make any friends by saying, uh, I don't think it's ready for prime time in clinical use and we shouldn't be making decisions based on it. No. And I can hear a collective groan <laughs> across many <laughs> uh, people's microphones right now. Look, I think that's been very helpful, you know, giving us, you know, your view of the state of play at the moment and, and I guess some of the emerging biomarkers that are that are coming through. Sort of as a translational researcher, I'd be really interested, you know, to finish up on your view of, you know, what, we do, what do we need to be doing to improve clinical translation of biomarkers? I mean, obviously, you know, making sure there's collection of specimens and appropriate specimens during clinical trials is absolutely critical. And I think we're obviously getting better, um, you know, as a field in, in that respect. What else do you see that's kind of lacking or limiting um, biomica translation at the moment? What would you like to see more of? So working groups that actually work. Um, not all working groups are actually working. Um, they get together to fill in time really rather than get things done. But I think a very functional working group where you have, now that we have the exome data from these studies, the gene expression profiling from these studies and a whole series of um, blood biobanked tissue, uh, bi blood biorepositories, sit down and work out how best to use those. For, um, you know, Wilbert Zwart, I was actually speaking with him earlier today. He's just done a study of um, new adjuvant enzalutamide um, uh, three months and has got tissue before and after and seeing what he's done with that and that and he's got some epigenetic work and I suggested well why doesn't he look at the exomes and see if the tumor suppressors have a certain epigenetic profile which leads to the poor outcomes 
And that's Lee Ellis's work where the P53 RB have a really bad outcome and have an epigenetic portfolio. So he's the only person I know actually right now has the data set of the exomes and the epigenetics. Lee Ellis has the science paper. So I think um, setting up some sort of um, Uber or Airbnb matchmaker um, opportunity between a basic science finding with people such as the health with the lipid omics and items like that and working out what the uh, tissue repositories and the omics epigenetics exome mutation um, RNA profiling can actually be used to actually uh, corroborate in some of the basic science findings but most of the clinicians don't know the basic science findings and many of the basic scientists may not be as familiar with the clinical um, sample repositories. So I think the best thing we need to be doing, and there is, as you know, because you're going to be part of it, the um, working groups to actually um, have that matchmaking opportunity of thinking how can the data sets the, that have been established corroborate basic science findings and how can the basic science findings um, inform how to do the biomarker work. Yep, couldn't agree more, Chris. And I think, um, you know, personally, ends up has been really great uh, with this meeting that it really does bring a lot of us together that perhaps don't have other fora to uh, to share those ideas. So, um, so very much appreciate your time talking to us today. And, uh, and thanks again for being part of the meeting. It's fantastic to be part of the meeting, hopefully in person soon. Absolutely. Which we might be 2022. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Cheers, everyone.